Joshua chapter 7. What we're going to be looking at today is defeat. Defeat in a small city called, we call it Ai. Um, archaeologists refer to this small city as just I. And uh, if there were three cities, it would be I, I, I. But anyway, um, <laughs> I don't know where that comes from. I'm sorry. I apologize. I'm just old. But here we are. <laughs> But I call it AI just, just because that's how I've heard it all my spiritual life. Verse 1, I'm only going to read verse 1, get into an introduction. We're looking at a defeat at AI. In uh, Joshua chapter 7, verse 1, it says, The children of Israel committed a trespass regarding the accursed things for Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed things, so the anger of the Lord burned against the children of Israel. Now, God had made promises to the nation of Israel, as we know, concerning the entering in and the possessing of what has been referred to and what is referred to as the land of promise or the promised land. And as I've been mentioning to you, this particular promise concerning entering in and, and possessing the land uh, was first given to a man by the name of Abraham. In Genesis, if you take notes, chapter 12, verse 7, it says, The Lord appeared to Abraham and said to your offspring, I will give this land. In Genesis 15, 18 through 21, it says, On that day the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said, To your descendants I give this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, Kenizzites, Cadmonites, Hittites, Perizzites, Rephite, Rephites, Amorites, Canaanites, Girgashites, Jebusites. <laughs> and you know the other tribes. Well, that promise that God gave uh, began to be fulfilled when Joshua and, uh, and his men took the city of Jericho, as we saw recently. God had said, I'm going to be with you. And I'm going to give you victory. Now Moses had instructed the people and the priests concerning this, and it's recorded in Deuteronomy chapter 20 what he had said. In Deuteronomy 20, verses 3 and 4, it says, He, speaking of the priest, shall say to them, Hear, O Israel, today you are on the verge of battle with your enemies. Do not let your heart faint. Do not be afraid. Do not tremble or be terrified because of them. The Lord your God is he who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. And so God had given his guarantee that they would be victorious, that he would not leave them alone, but he would be with them and actually the one who would fight against the enemies. So as we've seen, they marched around the city, they blew trumpets, and God tore the walls down. We noticed that... Uh, when, when this happened, the people went into the city and they took the city. So what that was to do was to, to uh, cause uh, Israel and cause Joshua to have confidence in the word of God because God could be trusted. God had said in Joshua chapter 1, verse 3, every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you as I said to Moses. And so they have these promises from God that they can hold fast to. God has said it, will he not do it? And so they went in and they, they took that, they possessed that city. So after the victory over Jericho, uh, Joshua pronounced a curse. And, and we saw that in chapter 6, verse 26, where it says, uh, Joshua charged them at that time, saying, Cursed be the man before the Lord who rises up and builds this city, Jericho. He shall lay its foundation with his firstborn, and with his youngest he shall set up its gates. And so Joshua actually pronounced a curse against the city of Jericho. Interestingly enough, and I didn't mention it last time we were together, that curse was literally fulfilled right around 500 or so years later when there was a king in the northern tribes by the name of Ahab. During his reign, Jericho was rebuilt. And it says in 1 Kings 16, verse 34, in his, in Ahab's days, Heal of Bethel, built Jericho. He laid its foundation with Abiram, his firstborn, and with his youngest son, Segub, he set up its gates according to the word of the Lord, which he had spoken through Joshua, the son of Nun. 
And so even though a curse had been pronounced against Jericho, they went about to restore it, and that curse was fulfilled in the lives of these individuals who went about to rebuild that city. Now, in their victory, God had made it clear that he would keep his word for their good. And so in this chapter, he's going to make it clear that he will also deal with them if they disobey. As a believer, I really enjoy the promises of God for my good. But not only does God give promises, but God also gives warnings. And we need to take the whole counsel of God in. And so on the one hand, God had made a promise. I will give you the city. I will be with you. I will fight on your behalf. It's as good as yours. That's his promise. But he also has set conditions. When you study the uh, Old Testament and you go through the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 28 in the book of Ju Deuteronomy has uh, a portion of Scripture that speaks of the blessings God promises Israel. But it also has a portion where God says, uh, if you don't keep my word, these are the things that will occur to you. And these are not blessings. They are actually curses that will fall on the nation. In Deuteronomy, for example, chapter 28, verse 7, it says, The Lord will cause your enemies who rise against you to be defeated before your face. They shall come out against you one way and flee before you seven ways. And so that's what the Lord was fulfilling through their obedience as they entered into and take that city of Jericho. They were in the center of his will. They were doing what God had said to do, and thus the enemies fled before them. But he also says in the same chapter at verse 25, if, if you are disobedient, then other things will happen, the things that, that are really called curses. The Lord will cause you to be defeated before your enemies. You shall go out one way against them and flee seven ways before them, and you shall become troublesome to all the kingdoms of the earth. And so in this chapter, we see how disobedience put them in the position of being chastised. One of the things we need to remember as we go through this study and as we consider uh, what the Word of God is saying in all to us, what, one of the things we need to continually keep in the forefront of our mind is that God uh, does exist and God is personal and God takes disobedience extremely seriously and God does not ignore disobedience. Sometimes we may think that He ignores it, but He doesn't. And if God has said it, then He's going to fulfill it, for, both for what we would call our good and also, he will fulfill his word when it comes to having to chasten or chastise us. Some believers actually seem surprised when things aren't going well for them. But I've discovered that sometimes things aren't going well for me or sometimes things aren't going well for others because we're actually in a state of unrepentant sin. And God is simply chastening us. And, and we don't even realize that because we think, well, everything's supposed to work out to be really good for me, but we fail to realize that sometimes we're simply going to reap what we sow. And if we're sowing to the flesh, from the flesh we will indeed reap corruption. That's something that you find in both the Old and the New Testament, that, that sense that God gives to us of saying, if you do wrong, I will deal with you. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 5, it says, You should know in your heart that as, as a man chastens his son, so the Lord your God chastens you. And so there are times when God actually brings a, a chastisement, a chastening to us for disobedience. And that's the Old Testament, somebody says, but it's also in the New. Revelation 3.19 says it like this, as, a, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, therefore be zealous and repent. And so what we see here in chapter 7 is the chastening hand of the Lord because of sin that has been found in the camp of Israel. It says in verse 1 in Joshua 7, the children of Israel committed a trespass regarding the accursed things. Now, God had made it very clear what the Israelites were to do. We had seen that already in chapter 6, but let me refresh your memory. In chapter 6, verse uh, 17 through 19, uh, there he had said, the city shall be doomed by the Lord to destruction, it and all who are in it. Only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all who are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. And you, by all means, keep yourselves from the accursed things, lest you become accursed when you take of the accursed things and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. But all the silver and gold and vessels of bronze and iron are consecrated to the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord." 
So God had already given them specific commandments related to the things that they would find there in the city of Jericho. The silver and gold belong to the Lord, and they're to be consecrated unto him as a kind of first fruits of the land, a kind of offering in that way. But instead of obeying, there's a man by the name of Achan. And Achan took the accursed things, and when he did that, and you'll see this in some detail in a moment, when he did that, it provokes the Lord to anger. Now, what's interesting is, though it is Achan who sinned in this way, Achan's sin affects the entire nation. I want you to notice, it says, the children of Israel committed a trespass regarding the accursed thing. And yet, when we get into this chapter, we're going to see that it wasn't all of them, it was one of them, a man by the name of Achan. And yet, the entire nation is going to be dealt with because of his sin. His sin affects everybody. You see, his impurity affects the purity of the entire nation. There's a principle, you find it in more than one scripture. Galatians 5 verse 9 says, A little leaven leavens the whole lump. And so this sin that Achan has committed, and it would seem that there was a knowledge of his sin that was shared in the family. Undoubtedly, Mrs. Achan knew about it, and the kids probably did too. But that, that impurity that um, came about through the, uh, through the sinfulness of Achan actually is affecting the whole nation. So God is not looking at it as simply the sin of Achan. God is going to deal with an entire nation because of one man's sin. You see, Israel was to be one nation. Israel together was to follow and obey God. So Achan's sin affects the entire nation, and God is angry with them all over it. Now, in New Testament terms, we need to remember and realize, really, that individual Christians' lives most definitely affect the entire witness of the church in the world. Just because people may not realize it doesn't mean that it's not true. An individual Christian's sin, when found out, affects everybody. It affects the body of Christ. How does it do that? Well, it weakens us, it makes us impure, but it also affects our testimony and witness to the world. Because there are numbers of people who are not Christians who look at Christians and will say, I don't want to be a Christian, and then you say, why not? And uh, all of us, I think, have heard this in our lifetime. As a believer, they'll say something like, because I've known too many hypocrites who claim to be Christians and don't live for Jesus Christ. And though we will say, you know, all of us sin and fall short of the glory of God, there's not a single person who's perfect. Not one of us is going to be able to live spotless lives. We're all going to stumble and fall. We get up and we seek the Lord and we repent and ask for forgiveness and move on. That's not sufficient for a lot of people because they're blaming the entire message of the gospel and saying that it's really not valid based on the life of one or two or three people that they've met over a lifetime that they consider to be hypocritical. So sin does affect, and it does have a very bad effect on, on, on our witness, and, and the Lord does bring chastening because of it. The sin that individual Christians harbor and the sins that individual Christians practice also affects the entire church. And so that's what's taking place here. The children of Israel committed a trespass. Well, verse 2, Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside Beth Aven, on the east side of Bethel, and spoke to them, saying, Go up and spy out the country. So the men went up and spied out Ai, and they returned to Joshua and said to him, Do not let all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and, and attack Ai. Do not weary all the people there, for the people of Ai are few. And so... They're in a place called Ai. That word Ai, or I, uh, literally is translated ruins or a heap. It was a small town. It's just west of the Jordan. It's close by Jericho. It's within about 10 miles of Jericho, the city of Jericho. And it is a small town. Shouldn't have posed a great problem to, uh, to the Isra Israelis because it only numbers, and we'll see this in chapter 8, verse 25, in total population, it only numbers 12,000. 
And that's why they say it's a small town. We can go in. You don't have to send all of our military there. We can take care of it uh, pretty easily. And so we should be able to take it with no problem. Well, the problem is that Israel is still rejoicing in their victory at Jericho. And though that victory is God's, it didn't take long for them to think that it was their victory. And so they're beginning to think now that they did it. And so they're thinking, if, if we took the fortified city, how difficult will it be to take this one? This is going to be very easy. We don't have to weary the people there. We can go in and take it. And so they're, they're failing to realize that no matter how small the challenge may be, it's still an impossibility without God on your side. It's the small foxes that ruin the vine. It's not the large battles, guys, that we go into that necessarily become our downfall. It's the small ones that we take for granted, thinking that it's okay, we can get through this, it's not going to be a problem. The big problems, we fall on our face before God, don't we? And we pray and say, God, help me. How am I going to do this? It's impossible. But the smaller things, the things that don't seem to be that consequential, are the things that we, we don't really pray that much about. Somebody has a cold. And how often do you really pray, God, would you heal me of this cold? Oh, I have a terrible cold. Very seldom do we really do that. But somebody hears that they might have cancer. Do our prayers get more serious at that point? Absolutely. Oh, God, it's the big C. It's going to take my life in Jesus' name. And we pray with all of this passion. It's the small things that we have a tendency of disregarding. The larger things we know we need God in. And so here they are, they're about to go into this small city. And so these, uh, these messengers return and say, you know, it's a, it's a small place, it's not going to be a lot, uh, very difficult, so just send a small group of men there, and, and that's all we need to do. Well, in verse 4, so about 3,000 men went up there from the people, but they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai struck down about 36 men, for they chased them from before the gate as far as Shabarim and struck them down on the descent. Therefore, the hearts of the people melted and became like water. It wasn't a complete slaughter. They lost 36 fighting men. But the defeat, the defeat to such a small city staggered them because they now realized God's hand isn't with us. He's withdrawn his help. They had crossed over the Jordan River. They ransacked Jericho. And now this, how could this have happened? Again, in the New Testament, Paul would say it like this. It's found in 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. It's this mentality of not being prepared, but also it's, it's a lack of awareness of what's really taking place behind the scenes. Well, when this happens, verse 6, Joshua tore his clothes and fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until evening, both he and the elders of Israel. They put dust on their heads, and Joshua said, Alas, Lord God, why have you brought this people over the Jordan at all to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites, to destroy us? Oh, that we had been content and dwelt on the other side of the Jordan. Oh, Lord, what shall I say when Israel turns its back before its enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear of it and surround us and cut off your name from the earth. Then what will you do for your great name? Well, he tore his clothes, put dust on his head. That's a symbol of grief, a symbol of mourning. And he begins to pray. Why did we come here in the first place? Now, he's not aware of the secret sin in the camp. So it's interesting to me how he begins his prayer, at least as it's recorded here. Because notice what he says, verse 7. Alas, Lord God, why have you brought this people over the Jordan to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites, to destroy us? And he's blaming God. Now, none of us would ever do something like that, right? We would never say, it's your fault, Lord. But that's how he begins. And I find that very interesting how he does that. He's not aware of the secret sin, so immediately he blames God. He's saying, why did you do this? Did you bring us here to destroy us? Or, he goes on, or did we presume upon you that you were leading us here and did that? Did that result in our judgment? I'm not quite sure what you've got going here, Lord. I, I need your help. You're going to need to make this clear. And then he goes on in verses 8 and 9. What shall we say? What shall I say when Israel turns its back before its enemies? And so on the one hand, I'm really confused. I don't know what's going on. 
But on the other hand, I, I want to protect the glory of the Lord. I'm concerned for your reputation. The heathen are going to mock you. They're not going to fear you. It's kind of like Moses' prayer in Deuteronomy 9, 27 and 28, where he prayed, Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Do not look on the stubbornness of this people or on their wickedness or their sin, lest the land from which you brought us should say, because the Lord was not able to bring them to the land which he promised them, because he hated them, he's brought them out to kill them in the wilderness. So he's trying to protect the glory of the Lord, but he doesn't understand what has taken place. Lord, how come things aren't going the way that you said they would? You had said everywhere the sole of my, my foot shall, shall step will be ours. And so we took Jericho and it was under your guidance, provision. You're the one who did it. We go to this small city with 12,000 population total. And I send a, a small band of men. Their 3,000 should have been sufficient. And they end up losing 36. And they chased us. What's going on here? Well, verse 10. The Lord said to Joshua, get up. Why do you lie thus on your face, sissy boy? <laughs> actually, that's a sarcastic thing. The Lord is actually saying, literally, stop whining. That's what he's saying. Israel has sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. For they have even taken some of the accursed things and have both stolen and deceived and they, they have also put it among their own stuff. Therefore, the children of Israel could not stand before their eni enemies, but turned their back before their enemies, because they have become doomed to destruction. Neither will I be with you anymore unless you destroy the accursed from among you. Stop whining and start acting. There is a reason that this has happened, and there's something that needs to be dealt with. God is, is literally saying, I haven't changed, but the people have sinned. You see, through Achan, they broke their vow. They stole what was not theirs. They acted deceitfully, and they took for themselves what belonged to God. And God is saying, this is why you fell before your enemies, and will continue doing so until you deal with this. You cannot let sin remain. You can't. When Paul was writing to the Corinthians in the New Testament, Paul was writing concerning the fact that they had a sin that they had allowed to continue in their congregation that had not been dealt with. Paul said, it's a serious sin. It's a sin that isn't even mentioned among the Gentiles, that a man should have his father's wife. In other words, you have a member of the church who is committing sexual sin with his father's wife, not his biological mother, but the woman married to his father, which is incestuous. And he's saying, and you haven't repented. As a matter of fact, you're actually glorying in it. And the reason it would appear that they were glorying in it was because they may have been exalting grace that was, they believed, present in their midst, and thus they were tolerating a sin that God had strictly dealt with and forbidden in his scriptures. And that sin that was being committed in the Corinthian church is referred to as leaven that leavens the lump. When you allow sin to continue unchecked, it destroys the holiness of the body of Christ. And the Lord begins to remove his hand of blessing from the people. And Paul is saying, instead of just glorying in this sin, you need to deal with it severely. That individual needs to be excommunicated, needs to be removed from the body of Christ because he's infecting it. Because your lack of action on this sin is giving the impression that God is good with that sin. He's all right with it. But God isn't good with that sin. It is something that God sent his son Jesus Christ to die on the cross to set us free from. 
And to keep in sin like that and not deal with it is to cause impurity to find a home in the church. And so you see that mentality in the Old Testament and the nation of Israel, but you see a similar mentality in the New Testament. Sin needs to be dealt with. And the bottom line was, it needs to be dealt with now, or else God says, I'm going to take my hand of blessing from you. And so he's saying, there is a sin here. Some of, uh, someone has taken of the, uh, the accursed things, the things that were to be dedicated to God. They stole, they deceived, and they put it among their own things. So this individual thought that they could get away with it. They thought that they were able to, to hide that from the Lord. But, but God is revealing to Joshua the reason that they fell, because their sin in the camp. Listen, Joshua and the leaders could not detect it, but God still had. I, I can speak from a leadership perspective in this. I can speak as a Christian, uh, but I can speak as a Christian leader, and I can tell you this. I can tell you that I've met many people over the years who, upon first meeting them, can be impressed with them because they have a, um, a sense about them, maybe of gentleness or a loving spirit or kind, but I don't really know them. I, I don't live in their home. I don't see how they really act. I don't travel with them to work. I'm not with them on the job site. I don't really know them. I just, they'll walk up and say, hi, how are you? And I'll say, I'm fine. And, and I'll tell Marie, I'll say, what a nice guy. But, but I don't know them. It's not that I should judge them or anything, but I don't know them, right? And, and, and because I don't know them, I don't know what they're really all about. How can I? I remember a fellow who used to be in our church when the church first began over 30 years ago now. And we went to his house. And um, he was a real gentle-spoken man, real kind to us, very hospitable. And his wife was a real sweet young lady, very nice. And, and Marie and I went to their house and, uh, on, on a few occasions. You know, spent some time with them. We liked them. Church was new. They were, we were friendly with them and all. And I thought that they were, were real sweet people, and I thought he was just an, a nice guy. Until one day, we had to counsel the wife because he was a, a, an abuser, because he beat his wife. Uh, and I, I, you, you, could, you could knock me over with a feather. This, he, he beats his wife up? But there she is, all bruised and battered, and it's a habit that he has. Real quiet, real gentle, real nice. But when nobody is around, he's what he really is, right? How do you know? How can we know? How would Joshua know? I mean, you have this entire nation. How would I know that somebody went in to Jericho and took what doesn't belong to him, stole the accursed thing? How would Joshua know? That's why Joshua, Joshua couldn't. And yet God is still, still revealing it. And God is saying, just because you don't see it doesn't mean it's not there. In Psalm 90, verse 8, it says, You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins, in the light of your countenance. Our secret sins. The things that we think nobody knows about. The things that we think we get away with. The things that we think that we can hide. And guess what? Of course, we can hide them from one another. There, there are married couples that, that, that have experienced uh, one, one member of that, of that uh, marriage, one spouse, uh, hiding, living a secret life, and, and they're not even aware of it because they're so good at it. We had somebody in this church. It's going to make this church look real bad, huh? There's a church I'm, a, I'm familiar with, I know. We had somebody in this church who um, wanted, wanted to move into a leadership position here. This is, again, about 28 years ago. It's a long time ago. And uh, we had a leadership retreat, and I invited this person to come, wanted to share. He was involved in... Christian ministry outside of the four walls of this fellowship. Had a good reputation and all of that. And uh, it was an older guy. You know, at that time I was probably in my early 30s. And so he was an older guy. He was in his 40s. Some old geezer. And uh, nice enough guy. 
and then I find out he's a bigamist. He's got two separate families, married to two different women. Two different women. How can you do that? It's hard enough to be married to one, but that's another, that's another story. How do we know these things? How can I know these things? They're hidden sins. They're found out. He was found out. He was found out. They're found out. God does not allow these things to remain. He has a love for us that is so great, he just exposes them. Our secret sins, he exposes in the light of the countenance. Hebrews 4.13 says, there's no creature hidden from his sight. All things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. You can't hide anything from God. He sees everything. And even when we think they're a secret, in reality, God sees it very clearly. And so he says to him in verse 13, get up, sanctify the people, say, sanctify yourselves for tomorrow, because thus says the Lord God of Israel, there's an accursed thing in your midst, O Israel. You cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the accursed thing from among you. Verse 14, in the morning, therefore, you shall be brought before you shall be brought according to your tribes, and it shall be uh, that the tribe which the Lord takes shall come according to families, and the family which the Lord takes shall come by households, and the household which the Lord takes shall come man by man. Then it shall be that he who is taken with the accursed thing shall be burned with fire, he and all that he has, because he's transgressed the covenant of the Lord and because he has done a disgraceful thing in Israel. So in a nutshell, God tells them, go through Israel. Literally, you're going to be going house by house until the guilty party is discovered. And after that guilty party is discovered, you will enact capital punishment. Well, it says that uh, this individual is discovered. You see what happens in verse 16. Joshua rose early in the morning and brought Israel by their tribes, and the tribe of Judah was taken. And he brought the clan of Judah, and he took the family of the Zarites. And he brought the family of the Zarites, man by man, and Zabdi was taken. Then he brought his household, man by man, and Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah was taken. So there's a slow process, process of elimination. Each tribe is dealt with. They come to the tribe of Judah. From the tribe of Judah, there's a man there who is found to be guilty. His name is Achan. He is the perpetrator. So, verse 19, Joshua said to Achan, you're dead meat, buddy. No. Joshua said to Achan, my son, I beg you, give glory to the Lord God of Israel, make confession to him, and tell me now what you've done. Do not hide it from me. Give glory to God. God is the one who has seen. God is the one who has revealed his sin. You need to openly admit and confess your sin. I'm trying to think of how to say what I'm about to say in a way that makes it clear and understandable. You know, when I say we've seen this in the past, you know, for you who have just started coming to this fellowship, you may not realize that this church has been going for since 81. So we're in our 32nd year. I've been in ministry for 39 years. So if you take that into consideration when you hear the things that I say, maybe it'll give you some balance or perspective because... If you've been doing something like this for a long time, then you gain something called experience. You've had opportunity to see quite a number of things over the years, and that's just the way it is. So I really want to be careful when I speak of our own fellowship here because I don't want to give the impression that right now you're sitting next to somebody that you should be careful with because they're sticking their hand in your purse right now and taking your wallet. I want to, 
I don't want you to you know, be all paranoid like that, though we have had purses stolen from this church. It's true. We've had cars stolen out of the parking lot. Radios and CDs and DVDs. We've had palm trees stolen off the lot. We had somebody come and steal windows once, and one of my ad- my assistants helped him load the truck. A former assistant. He's now installing windows somewhere else. We've had people come into the bookstore and steal. They do it every year. We've had Bibles stolen, one of the most popular stolen items in the church, next to, uh, next to the music. Um, you'd be surprised. I'll just put it that way. I was, I was when we caught the first guy we ever caught shoplifting in a church bookstore, stealing a Bible. Turn on to Exodus 20, thou shalt not steal. (laughs) I said, Raul, go steal from your own bookstore. (laughs) Steal one of your books, nobody buys them anyway. (laughs) Ooh. (laughs) <laughs> sin you catch them and like Joshua is saying my son there's compassion my son is, is a kind he's treating him kindly even though he knows judgment's coming he's treating him kindly you don't see him as all angry and vindictive here do you you see him as as actually pleading with him in a kind fashion. My son, give glory to God. Confess your sin. Sitting in my office with the guy we caught stealing in the bookstore, that's how I treated him. You're stealing from God. You're taking from the Lord. Think about it. It's wrong. But you want to know something? Achan is going to be judged. We'll see this in a moment. We already know what happened. But I can tell you through experience that one of the number one things that I see is when people get caught, they still don't cop to it. They still don't admit it. They can be caught with, 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 with the Bible in their hand or with the music in their, in, in their back. They're caught with it, and they don't admit it. And... and to me, it is one of the amazing realities. It's absolutely amazing how deceived and self-deceived we can be where we're caught. And the first thing we do is, is we blame somebody else or we'll, we'll try and weasel our way out somehow. It's somebody else's fault. It's not mine. Joshua says, Give glory to God. He saw you. He's exposed this. You saw how it came down to you. Is no doubt about it. You're the man. Now, confess. Confess. Admit that you were wrong. Admit what you've done. You see, again, God's desire isn't that people should perish. God really has the desire that people would be treated with mercy. Ezekiel 33, 11 uh, it reads, say to them, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. And then the Lord says, turn, turn from your evil ways. For why should you die, O house of Israel? God is a holy God. And he doesn't take sin lightly. And he deals with it. And the whole the whole nation was, was being penalized. 36 innocent men, innocent at least in the sense of knowing what had happened. They didn't know. 36 men died because of Achan, because of his sin, because of what he did. And so God is going to deal with this. And so he's told, you need to confess. Well, in verse 20, Achan answered and answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and this is what I've done. 
when I saw among the spoils a beautiful Babylonian garment, 200 shekels of silver, a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them and took them. And there they are, hidden in the earth, in the midst of my tent, with the silver under it. You know, guys, when you think of ancient cities, don't fall into the trap of thinking that they were just a bunch of, uh, like, uh, just, just some cheesy-looking dwelling places, maybe made of some small bricks and just open windows and dirt floors. That's not how they were. We've been to some of the ruins and, and in Israel, Beth Shan and others. When, when you go and you see these cities, the cities were, were modern. They, were, they, had un, un, they had running water. They had, uh, they had shop after shop after shop, like a, like a mall. They had, they had tile floors. They had uh, paved roads. Uh, they had, it, it, it's like it was unbelievable. And so what are you speaking about here in Jericho? Is Jericho was obviously a fortified city. It was well populated. And Jericho had its own Rodeo Drive. So if you, if you can think like that for a moment, we're not talking about walking into a Costco and I saw, you know, 50-pound sacks of potatoes and I took them. It's not that. It's like if you walked in to one of the high-dollar stores in, in Paris or in Rome or London, Beverly Hills, and you, and you walk in and, and you're amazed at at how opulent this thing is. One of the guys in our fellowship was speaking to me just last week, and he was saying how he was doing some work in a home that I believe, I may be wrong in this figure, I, I believe I remember it rightly, that he said the home that he was working in, we're talking about a home that he was working in that ha was $70 million. A house. See, I, I, can't get my, I can't get my head around that. $70 million with like 25 plus bedrooms. And huge acreage in, uh, out there in, uh, by Westwood. Some sheik owns it. And he says, yeah, I was in there. He said, they have a prayer room. The guy's a Muslim. He has a prayer room. He said, that's huge that uh, he goes in and prays. He only goes there uh, four months out of the year. Uh, the rest of the year, it's empty. This guy has so much money. See, I can't get my mind around that kind of thing. I can't. But there are some who do and some who understand. And Achan came into Jericho, a walled city, fortified city, powerful city. And it isn't just a, a bunch of little small shacks. This is a place that had shopping center. It had everything. And it's equivalent to walking in to one of these places that imports. And he said, and there was a Babylonian garment there, which is a high dollar item. And I saw it and I wanted it. It's like if you walked into, and I can't even think, I don't know the names of some of the nicest places. Some of you could probably help me with that because I really don't know the names of these places because we're never going to go into any of them. We'll look at them maybe if we drive by fast. So I'm unable to, I really don't. I wish I could say I magged in or something. I don't know. Nordstrom's is expensive to me, so I don't get it. But if you're there on Rodeo Drive, nobody's around. You walk into the business. There's these imported suits from Italy. And that one, oh, that's nice. I'm going to take it. You go to the cash register and you open it up. And all of this money's in there. In the back of your mind, you're thinking, they're never going to use this. Who's going to miss it? And that's what happens. The temptation. I coveted it. I saw it. I wanted it. It had a, a grip on my heart. I walked in there, and I, I just, I really wanted that. I saw it. I coveted it. I took it, and I hid it. That's what I did. Steps to failure. I saw it. It had an appeal to my eye. I coveted it. It, it got, it got a, 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 a toehold in my heart. And so I, I picked it up. And once I finally had it in my possession, I couldn't let it go. So I hid it. That's, that's how he failed. They knew. God had already said, the silver and the gold belong to me. 
everything else is to be destroyed. Where is he going to wear this beautiful Babylonian garment? Is he going to put it on in his tent? Kind of walk around, hey, baby, look at me. I mean, what? where are you going to wear it? And why do you need it so bad? But he did. He wanted it so badly that he was willing to do anything for it. That's where seeing something and coveting something. Very dangerous. And Paul said that he has learned to be content in whatever state he's in. Why could he say that? He said, look, it, I've had much and I've had little. And I've learned to be content in whatever state I am. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I've had much and I've had very little. But the thing that's the key to my contentment, this a lot of Christians have missed, is my fellowship with God. This is eternal life, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Give us this day our daily bread. Lord, teach us to be content with what you've given to us and to use what you've given to us for your glory. And if you give me much, then I'll give you back much. But whatever you give me, I'm going to give back to you because I know from your hand I've received all these blessings. And my contentment comes from my relationship with you. Achan, he walks in and he sees this unbelievable, beautiful garment imported from Babylon. He sees the silver, he sees the gold. He conceives a thought in his heart, takes it, buries it. Nobody even knows I have this, he thinks, but the Lord knows. Well, the problem is, Somebody's watching, and the one who was being robbed was God himself. You see, the silver and the gold was to be consecrated to the Lord. The garment was to have been destroyed. So verse 22, so Joshua sent messengers, and they ran to the tent, and there it was, hidden in the tent with the silver under it. And they took them from the midst of the tent, brought them to Joshua and to all the children of Israel, and laid them out before the Lord. Then Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan the son of Zerah, the silver, the garment, the wedge of gold, his sons, his daughters, his oxen, his donkeys, his sheep, his tent, and all that he had. And they brought them to the valley of Achor. Joshua said, Why have you troubled us? The Lord will trouble you this day. So all Israel stoned him with stones, and they burned them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. Then they raised over him a great heap of stones, still there to this day. So the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger. Therefore, the name of that place has been called the Valley of Acre to this day. The Valley of Acre, the word Acre means trouble. The Valley of Trouble. I've said this before. I'll just say it briefly. Your sin, my sin, doesn't just affect me. Doesn't just affect me. I had a dream many years ago now, probably 20 years or more. And in my dream, and I've said this before to you, and I actually repeat this, in my dream, so I want to make sure the word dream, in my dream, I had a dream. There's a reason why I keep repeating the word dream. Because somebody's not hearing it. That's why I'm saying it again. In my dream, I committed adultery. And it felt real that I had really done that. Because dreams for me are very real. I, I, I have the most realistic dreams. And in this, in this dream, I, I had committed adultery, but I saw the ramifications of that because 
as I was dreaming, I had to confess my sin to Marie and my wife. And when I, when I confessed my sin to Marie, I saw the look in her eyes that she would actually have if I were to actually commit such a sin. It was a broken heart. It was so broken, her whole countenance changed in front of me. It was her shoulders slumped. I still remember it. Her, her eyes were filled with tears and her little lips began to quiver and tears began to flow. And, and it was such a pain. And, and I felt that pain. I felt the pain of, of saying, honey, I have been unfaithful to you. And then in my dream, I'm transported to speak to my four children who were small at that time. And I looked at Corinne and David and Joseph and Anna. And I said, Daddy has been unfaithful to your mama. And I watched their faces as they broke. It was so real. I saw the tears form in David's eyes and Corinne. I saw it. And their little heads bowed down and the tears that they suffered. I felt it. And then I had to tell my church. And it all, dreams are so quick. You just have, I mean, it's over, but it, it felt like a prolonged dream where I stood in the pulpit and I looked at the congregation at that time and I said, I have failed God. I have failed my family. I have failed you. It was so real. And I saw the brokenness of my congregation. And then I woke up and I turned and looked at Marie and I thought, I will never do that to this family, to this woman, to my church. I will never do that. Sin has repercussion. It isn't just you. I have the people want to argue. Oh, it's just me. It's not hurting anybody. It hurts everybody. It's not just you. And it's not just your small family. It is everybody who knows you. It is your parents, should they still be alive. It's your brothers, your sisters, should you have them. It's your cousins. It's your friends. It's every person that is part of your web of friendships. Everybody's affected by one sin. We all are. And the body of Christ suffers because of it. And those who would argue and say, it's just me, those who would argue that do not read their Bibles. I guarantee you, they don't read the Bible. Because you cannot believe that and read the Bible at the same time. You can't. You read your Bible, and 1 Corinthians chapter 12 says, though we are many, yet we are the one body. Hands and feet, eyes, ears, we all belong to one another. We're connected. We are the body of Christ. And when a sin is committed, it affects us all. So when somebody takes their liberty in the name of Jesus and goes out and does what they do, it affects the reputation of the church they attend. It affects the name of Christ whom they profess to be their savior. It affects the church at large because that person seeing them committing this kind of sin is saying within themselves, what a hypocrite. And it isn't something that God ignores. You know, the one thing that we, we have to understand is God is long-suffering. He's patient to us. He's not willing that we should perish. But that doesn't mean that he won't deal with our sin. And, 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 and what I'm trying to share with you as I'm closing this is a very simple thing you find in Scripture, both old and new, and that is having a healthy fear of the Lord. God loves you enough to not let you get away with it. He loves you enough to not let you get away with it. He's not the kind of dad who kind of ignores things and says, oh, it's just, yeah. he's not that way. He says, no. If you're mine, I will chasten you. If you belong to me, I will spank you because you're my child. And a good parent always chastens it, the child. If a child is not chastened, it's because that child doesn't have a parent. But because I belong to the Lord, he will deal with it. In the Old Testament, Achan, his sin affected the whole nation of Israel. But the punishment came upon his family, his children, his wife. 
It would seem, by the way, that uh, the wife very well may have been complicit in this, aware of it, just kept it to herself. But she was judged along with her husband nonetheless. This is one of those passages where God is saying, I am the Lord, I will not be mocked. And maybe we, the church, even in the New Testament grace period that we're in, should remember what a holy God we serve and what he expects from us, which is simply to love him and obey him, demonstrating that we really do trust him and that we really do know him. Achan, Achan was dealt with. What a severe punishment to see that was placed on him. But what a warning to us. May we live in such a way that we really seriously believe there's a personal God who sees all things. May we do those things that please him.